Welcome to South Florida Saltwater Fishing. I'm Heath, and it's time to get into the boat. Wahoo in the boat, baby! Look at that kickfish right there. I mean, you talk about epic fishing days. Yeah! Nice bull dolphin right there. gonna go over the most likely scenario of what this massive 5,000 mile wide seaweed plume is going to do and how it's going to affect your fishing. Before we get into this though, if you want to learn more about fishing, grow as an angler, just see some great and exciting offshore fishing adventures, you can start by hitting the subscribe button. And don't forget to turn on a notification bell so that you won't miss a thing. All right, folks, so in case you haven't heard about it, there is this massive 5,000 mile wide seaweed plume that has happened. The Sargasso Sea blooms once a year. Sargasm weed floats up to the surface and the Atlantic currents, which flow in a circular pattern, bring it towards Florida. So as we look at thermal imaging from satellites, you can see this is massive. Yet it's not one big clump like you would imagine. It's scattered all over the place in massive clumps and as the wind and currents direct it, it will break apart. And as it's approaching Florida, they're discovering that more of it is on the south side of the Caribbean islands like Cuba and Jamaica and less of it is on the northern side of it. So scientists are actually predicting the bulk of it is going to travel into the Gulf of Mexico and the east coast of Florida will not get hit as hard as the Gulf. That being said, we're still gonna go over the likely scenario of what you are going to witness here in the coming months. So what you are not likely to see is these massive giant beds of organized sargasm holding loads of fish underneath them. You're also not likely to see very organized lines heading north to south that you can just head out and there's a clean side and a dirty side and you pick a side and you start trolling north, going with the current, looking to get the hookup. You are more than likely going to see endless amounts of scattered weed. And so what happens with these scattered weed lines as the prevailing winds shift from northeast to southeast is you get lines of scattered weed that go with the current breaks. So what it's gonna look like to you is scattered weeds, little scattered weed patches all over the place. They're gonna be a nuisance if you're trolling, you're gonna be picking them off, but you're gonna to have to sort of follow the pattern that will be heading from, you know, we got a southeasterly wind, right? And we're gonna have all these patches of weeds. So in there, there will be current breaks. And lots of weeds. So if you're trolling, you're more than likely not going to be going in a north-south pattern. You're going to have to follow the prevailing wind from the southeast and find these current breaks and you will head into the wind against the currents and try to find a path that somewhat gives you relief from the sargasm. And that's more than likely what you're going to witness when it comes to the pattern of this. And what will happen later in the day is you will have your northerly currents. And as the weed comes this way, it will start to gather up and jumble up against these current lines. And they'll be, you know, every mile, half mile apart and you'll start seeing jumbling apart. Now, that's more ideal for fishing situations, yet, the later the day goes on, the fish tend to go deeper. And by the time this has happened, these weed lines have been picked through by anglers. So the fish are kind of sketched out, even though they're hiding there, they might be there. You might see them, but they might not be, you know, so willing to eat. So sargasm weed is what we consider a life form when it comes to fishing. As it travels in the Atlantic currents, it holds many baby fish that are growing. It holds lobsters, mahi-mahi, jellyfish, everything that all the predators are feeding on. 
It provides a source of protection for these babies, and it also provides a source of shade for the larger fish. Now, yes, I agree it would be ideal if this was more organized, but like I said, it's not likely the case. You're more than likely going to be very busy picking weeds off your line if you're trolling. Whether it's topwater trolling or planer trolling, you're going to be, have to be dealing with it. Now, if it's too brutal on you, you can always stop and sort of sight fish, or you can find an area where the scattered weeds have sort of gathered and try chumming out the predators, see if they'll come out and are willing to eat. And then again, the weed's gonna be a nuisance when you're getting your fish up to the boat, they're gonna be swimming all through it and it's gonna be all around. Now, am I saying it's gonna be everywhere and brutally hard? Like you see these pictures they're showing you on the news of massive mounds of seaweed just gathered on the beaches and stuff. It's hard to say. I'm sure inland and close to the coast, there are gonna be huge mats because it's traveling towards the east coast of Florida. Same with the west coast, it's gonna bunch up on the coastlines. Further out though, it's more than likely just gonna be endless miles of scattered weed lines that you're gonna to have to sort of pick your way through and deal with. So I guess the ultimate question is, is well, is it gonna make the fishing better? I mean, we got all this weed and protection and forms of life and you know, it's traveling with the babies and the food and everything. So is it gonna make fishing better? The answer is yes and no. It's fishing, so on any given day, where the food is, is obviously where the predators are gonna be Yet we've got winds that change during these uh, times. Your southeasterly wind is what's going to drive your pelagic fish with the Atlantic currents that swoop around Florida and up the east coast. And then there's gonna be times where we get more of a westerly wind or a northern wind, which is going to sort of disrupt this plant, especially if you have a variable wind or a westerly wind, which will drive fish offshore. If you have a variable wind, that sort of turns fishing off and they go down deeper. Like I said, you're more than likely gonna be doing a lot of running and gunning and finding fish this summer. Which means you're gonna have to bust out those spro jigs or your sight pitching lures, your poppers or whatever, or get your cut bait and chum them up and wait for them. Live baiting too, with your pilchards or your ballyhoo, whatever, head offshore. Okay, and so when it comes to how is it gonna affect our fishing also, there's a common question asked. Well, hey, isn't it gonna sort of block out the sun and uh, take away the oxygen from the fish and sort of suffocate them? The answer is no. Sargasm weed is not inherently toxic to either humans or fish. It's a plant, it grows, it blooms. It will not deprive or starve the fish for the much needed oxygen. Now, unfortunately, on the west coast of Florida, you folks out there are gonna get sort of a double whammy. You're currently dealing with a red tide. Now, red tide algae starves the ocean of oxygen and kills fish. It's also toxic in the air to humans in abundance. And now, coupled with that, they've got a lot of this seaweed coming their way too, which is not gonna help the smell and the air quality and sort of the water quality in the Gulf of Mexico, which is shallow for miles on end. Okay, and so speaking of this large mass of seaweed that's heading towards our coastlines, there are a couple of ways that are being thought of of how to deal with it. The first way is actually manually removing it with front loaders and stuff on the beach. You may have seen this before when there's massive buildups of sargasm on the beach and the sun starts making it decay and it's stinking and it's actually causing lung issues with people, they bring in the heavy artillery and they actually start manually removing it. More recently, scientists have developed an idea that they can actually sink the seaweed. What their idea is, is they have all this seaweed mass built up. The scientists believe that they're going to be able to run giant nets around it and corral it, and then with a boat, sort of pull the net tight around it, and then they will submerge it. If you ever looked closely at sargasm weed, you'll notice little balls in it, which are air sacs that make it buoyant, make it float. Once you submerge sargasm to a certain depth, those air sacs actually deflate and the seaweed is no longer buoyant and it sinks. So they're going on this theory that they're going to be able to gather large masses of it 
and actually sink it down to the bottom of the ocean. The ultimate long-term effects of what they're planning on trying to do have yet to be seen. We won't know about it for years, maybe even decades. But this is an idea of what they are trying to actually do. All right, folks, and so that's pretty much what we're looking at in the coming months from this giant seaweed plume and how it's going to affect our fishing. It's not going to be too much different than what happens every year, yet it's going to seem a little bit more exaggerated. Like I said, the Sargasso Sea has bloomed like it does every year, and that's what recreational fishermen and charter fishermen wait for is all this to come in and bring the mahi-mahi in, in particular. Yet this year is going to be a little bit more challenging simply because of the massive amount of sargasm headed our way. Alright folks, that about does it for this episode. Hope you had fun, hope you enjoyed, and I hope you learned a little bit about what to expect when it comes to fishing and dealing with this sargasm couple of months ahead. Till next time, South Florida saltwater fishing, going wherever the cool wind takes us.